hello youtube welcome back to my channel good morning happy afternoon good evening whatever time of day it is that you're watching this i just want to say thank you for coming back to my channel if you saw my first episode and came back to watch a second one thank you so much i i'm gonna assume that means that you like the content if you're new here hi welcome thank you for coming and checking this out uh, today I'm gonna do my makeup for you guys and talk about a true crime story instead of doing like a true crime murder mystery series I'm gonna talk about some exonerations and so these are gonna be stories for people who were wrongfully convicted or accused or charged and eventually proven innocent so I hope you like stories like that if you do and you like makeup you should subscribe like watch the video all the way through that's Louie he's always in my business so he'll be around other than that let's get started so if you remember last week or if you watched last week I talked about a man named Jackie Wilson and Jackie had an older brother Andrew who actually committed the crime that Jackie was being charged for and Jackie served 36 years before they were able to kind of prove his innocence. And this case that we're gonna talk about today is related to Andrew Wilson, who is Jackie's older brother, who actually committed the crime. And this man that we're gonna talk about today, his name is Alton Logan. This story also takes place in Chicago, obviously, if they're connected. Alton Logan was born on August 22nd in 1953 in Detroit, Michigan. He lived there with his parents, Mary and Alton Logan Jr. So this Alton Logan is the third. And just six months after he was born, the family packed up and moved to Chicago. Alton's mother was said to be a very sweet, kind, caring woman. She was God-fearing. She was always in the church. She always had the boys, um, Alton and his younger brother, Tony. In the church he said they went like four or five times a week you know she would be very involved in the community and the community service that she did through the church she just represented the community well and she was just very involved and just always kind of had the boys involved as well Alton's father was a steel worker and you know he worked in like a plant and just worked really hard for his family they seemed to have a good system him and him and Alton's mother and they seem to have a lot of love between the two of them. So in the house, it's, you know, Alton Logan, who we're talking about, Alton's father, his mother, and his younger brother, Tony. When Alton was two years old, unfortunately, his father had just got off work. It was late. He was mugged outside of a liquor store where he stopped to just kind of cash his check. So he had just literally cashed his check, was bringing it home to the family when he was robbed and mugged outside of, you know, in the alley outside of a liquor store. And unfortunately, the muggers shot him and killed him. That crime was never solved. They never were able to find the murderers who committed the crime. Now, that leaves a lot of pressure on Alton's mom, right? Cause she's just like this young mother she had her whole family thing she thought she was like in a really good place and now she's turned into a single mom of two boys which is like it sounds like a really hard job to do i don't have any kids but i work with kids and i commend you know parents because i know that's such a difficult job and to go from having a two-parent household to having to you know all the pressure and everything just to be on her it became a lot. She was working multiple jobs. She was working late, doing everything that she could to just, you know, keep the house afloat and keep the boys afloat and all the things that they needed. And it was just a lot. She had a newborn, she had a two year old. Not only did she become overwhelmed because of the, the task of raising two boys on her own, two young children, but also she was grieving, she was in love and her significant other, the father of her children, who what, one of which is named after him, like I can't imagine how hard it must have been for her just every day to be around that and just not have the right time or the proper time to grieve her husband. And this all just became too much for her. So she ended up 
having the boys go live with their grandmother in Kentucky in a small town I guess called Jenkins and honestly I mean they loved it like their grandmother had a, a house with like land a farm she had like all of these trees in her yard that was like kind of the, the most memorable thing about what am I doing oh I forgot to say this look is gonna be like a Halloween look so I'm gonna do my halloween outfit makeup for you guys and show you like my costume and everything and so this is going to be a halloween themed video i'm sorry i meant to say that in the beginning the boys loved growing up um in their grandmother's home i mean she had trees you know she had so much land like it was just like a really good time for them you know all the neighborhood kids used to come over and climb on the trees and just play you know everybody loved this big huge farmland now their grandmother was really strict and she she just kind of continued the church situation you know that their mom had them going in so their grandma was really also involved in the church and she would have them you know going to church four or five times a week she also was involved in her community so they you know he just kind of grew up in the church and, and his family dynamic kind of stayed consistent in that sense no matter if he was living with his mom or if he was living with his grandma and he actually did go back home him and tony you know they were every they did everything together tony and alton you know they went home every summer they would come and stay in chicago and this became the normal routine until alton was 11 years old so for about nine years he lived with his grandma in kentucky and came home every summer to spend the summer with his mom and then he would go back to school out in Kentucky. Now, that kind of presented a little bit of problems when Alton turned 11 years old because his grandma started to, you know, she was getting older and she was raising two boys. She had already raised six children. Alton's mother was one of six. And so by the time she was raising these two, you know, very young boys, her age started to kind of wear on her. I mean, she was just getting older. You know how old people kind of know when like their time is starting to come. So she, she was like, all right, I'm trying to be closer to my children. And so she packed up Alton and his brother. They, the three of them moved up to Chicago since they were coming to spend the summer here every weekend. Any, I mean, every year anyway. However, when Alton got here now, he moved here in age 11 and by age 15 by the time he was a sophomore in high school he had dropped out now he said that he didn't he technically didn't drop out and he also technically wasn't expelled but the school just kind of came to this understanding that like he's not really showing up and doing the work and they don't really got time for that like they don't have a place for that so they were like you know i mean I don't really know what you want us to do. It don't seem like you got a lot of motivation to be here. So you don't, really don't need to come anymore. And that's just kind of what it came down to. It was just kind of like an understanding, but he was never like officially expelled, nor nor did he decide to drop out himself. Like it, it just kind of happened naturally. Now in today's world, the teachers would have to come up with some sort of plan to identify like what wasn't working for the student and figure out like you know we have ieps and all these things now where there's just like more options for students to succeed but back then people didn't care as much or we just didn't have the resources and so when alton got here and wasn't fully excelling in in the school i mean I, he probably became disinterested and was like you know what i'm not good at this and that means i'm not trying to do it so he dropped he left school at an early age i mean besides that he was having some sort of like behavioral problems you know he would get in trouble a lot but he was never violent it wasn't ever like he was getting in fights he just was kind of acting out in school and the teachers were like yeah we're not putting up with this and so he left school and pretty soon after that he started drinking he's tried to find work you know he kind of left school and just started trying to make his life for himself and trying to work because he couldn't just drop out and not do nothing you know so he he was trying to provide and contribute to the house by trying to find a job but it was difficult because for one he was only 15 and for two he really didn't have like a hefty skill set you know he was a kid that quit school and didn't have a lot of options and didn't understand maybe he didn't know like fully what his other options were 
And that drinking continued well into adulthood. As Alton got older, he kind of fell in with the wrong crowds and started making some not so good choices. But a lot of that was driven by the alcohol. Like a lot of, a lot of things that happened in his life were a re direct result of him being drunk or drinking you know, excessively. He had several run-ins with the police and when he appeared before the judge, you know, after he turned of age, the judge was like, listen, this path ain't working out for you. Like you, we keep giving you these opportunities. You keep making these shitty choices. Like you need to do better. So here's what I'm gonna tell you. Like either you can go to the army and get your shit together or go to jail. Which one do you want? There's no third option. Like, we're not going to keep giving you chances to go out in the streets and do fuck shit, like, around your neighborhood. So, naturally, Alton was like, um, yeah, I'll go to the army. What? I can get paid, get some skills under my belt, you know, that help my family out, stop, or, and not go to jail. Like, I'm not trying to do that. So, Alton was like, yeah, okay, I'm going to join the army. Let's do it. Sign me up. Put me in, coach. And about nine months in, he was dishonorably discharged due to his drinking. He could not, he was having a really hard time, you know, how it can get the best of us sometimes. If you don't have like the help or the people in your life, you know, it can be a, a really difficult struggle to be a part of and it was taken over his life. And so as a result, the army was like, man, look, we don't do that up in here. Like we got responsibilities and duties to each other and you can't just be in here doing that shit. So you got to go, brother. When he returned home, he, you know, was living back with his mom and he found a job with the neighborhood youth court. But again, he started kind of getting involved with the, in the streets and making not so good choices, getting in trouble. And he ended up robbing a man which sent him to jail for about five years. After he got out, he was kind of determined to change his life and like set himself up to be, to go on the right path and just figure out a different way to do things. Like he finally was able to hear the things that everybody had been telling him about how this way wasn't working for him and he needed to figure out something different. And so when he got out, he was like, all right, this is my time, like I'm gonna, try something different. I'm gonna try to, you know, make a better life for myself. But he had a really difficult time. Again, he didn't have a lot of skills under his belt. And this caused, you know, obviously a lot of difficulty when he was trying to turn his life around and just find like an honest living. So he was doing small things like finding cans and garbage on the roads. And then he would take it and like exchange it for cash or sell it for cash. And he did this all the way, you know, up until he was picked up by the officers for this crime. Now we can get into the crime and just kind of start understanding a little bit more about what happened next. On January 11th of 1982, two undercover police officers were working as security guards at a McDonald's on the far south side of Chicago. A cashier had signaled the guards when a man was changing orders suspiciously. At that moment, another man walked in busted in the doors with a sawed off shotgun and shot one of the officers immediately. This ended up killing one of the officers by the name of Lloyd Whitcliffe. The other officer's name was Alvin Thompson. And when Alvin saw this happen, he knocked Alvin down to the ground and fired at close range. Luckily, Thompson had threw his arms over his face and actually survived the attack because he was shot at point blank, and if he wouldn't have thrown his arms up, he sh certainly would have died that day. After the attack, the two men ran out, but they took with them the guns from both of the security guards. After interviewing some of the employees at the McDonald's that were there that night, they were able to identify one of the men as Edgar Hope in which Edgar Hope was caught on a Chicago bus. When police pulled Edgar off the bus, he actually was carrying the gun that belonged to Alvin Thompson, who was the survivor from the attack. In early February, just a few days later, Alton Logan was also arrested due to identification out of a lineup by the McDonald's employees, as well as the survivor 
Alvin Thompson. Despite having the identification uh, from the witnesses, there was no physical evidence pointing out to Logan to this crime. However, police were able to uncover the gun from the other officer who passed away, Lloyd Whitcliffe, when they searched a beauty salon looking for a man by the name of, you guessed it, Andrew Wilson. And when they found Andrew Wilson, he had the gun belonging to the other officer, Lloyd Whitcliffe. Which is weird because if Alton Logan did the murder, why would Andrew Wilson have the weapon of the victim? Make it make sense. Anyways, Alton Logan and Edward Edgar Hope were tried together in 1983. Both were convicted of the murder. Edgar Hope received the death penalty while Alton Logan received life without parole because two of the jurors just couldn't bring themselves to charge him with death. It's weird because throughout this case, you just kind of hear how people had the opportunity to like sabotage or, you know, make Alton's life more difficult than it already was. But people, there's kind of like this, underlying pattern that people really didn't want you and i think it's because and on some level people knew that he didn't do it and so you know even the jury's like charging the two men for the same exact thing in the same exact trial but not being able to feel right in just in giving elton logan the death penalty even though they they found him guilty for it and they found edgar hope they gave edgar hope the death penalties there's a lot of things that happen throughout this story that's kind of like that both were granted second trials just off of technicalities. However, they were both found guilty again and given the same sentence as before. Now, at the first trial, Alton Logan's lawyer was banned essentially from being able to use the evidence of the gun that was found in the beauty salon, which belonged to the crime scene that was found originally found on Andrew Wilson. Now at the second trial, he was allowed to present this evidence, but all other evidence linking Andrew and Hope was prevented from being able to be shared. As was one of the witness testimonies, which when in a lineup, the victim, I mean, the witness was a little confused because he said that the photo of Logan, I mean, Alton Logan closely resembled that of Andrew Wilson. But ultimately, the witness did say that it was Andrew Wilson that he recognized instead of Alton Logan. It was also said that Andrew Wilson's family was present at every single trial date and every single court date and every single hearing. Like they never wavered in their support for him and they, they believed he was innocent since the very beginning. They always supported him, they showed up all the time, kind of had some unwavering faith that he was innocent and that you know they were gonna stick beside him after his direct appeal of the second trial was unsuccessful alton filed another post conviction petition this time a public defender named erica reddick was assigned to defend him and miss erica did not come to play honey now i'm going to tell you guys a little bit about his life in prison and just like how everything was happening for him while he was appealing these cases like over and over and over again. Alton said he was 28, you know, when he first got arrested and he was pissed. Like he walked in, he came in the cell when he first got in there. He was just, he was just like big mad. Like he, he was like, fuck all these people, fuck this system. Like nobody wants to see me win. You know, that's how I felt. And I can only imagine because in real life, he's like, I ain't got nothing to do with this. I don't know these people. Like, why am I, you know, y'all just chose me out, out the crowd and decided that I was responsible for this. He just had, was losing faith, like, in people, in the system and everything. And so he was mad and he was kind of had this attitude of, like, y'all can't break me. You guys think you're going to put me in here? Like, watch. Watch what I'm going to do when I get in here. And he was just being, like, really really defiant he would get into it with the guards all the time he said over the course of his 26 years that he spent in prison he spent roughly three years in solitary confinement due to 
like bad behavior. It was also said that his cell had like a broken pipe and often would flood and he would have to ask and accept like dirty laundry from other prisoners in order to protect the, the belongings that he had in his cell. And he would have to like constantly put pile up things around the floor to like soak up the dirty water and just try to, you know, preserve or salvage whatever items he had left with him from his family. Eventually, Allison kind of had the same realization that he realized when he had first got out of jail and was trying to make an honest living. You know, he was like, this, this is not helping. Like, I'm only hurting myself by making things more difficult, by constantly getting into it with people and having to watch my back. You know, the guards aren't looking out for me because I keep pissing them off. And I'm only hurting myself. Like, nobody, you know, is causing the situation to be like this except for me like there's a way that I can have a better life experience being in here and this what I'm doing right now like this ain't it this this is the opposite of it and so at that point he was like all right well if I'm gonna be in here let me see let me get into something let me make some shake and so he went on to get his GED and then he got an associate in applied science he got a certificate for building maintenance. He took courses in carpentry, electrical installation, piping, welding. I mean, the man was just tired of like not having any skills and not having the education. He said, you know what? Y'all put me in here and that's the last that y'all are gonna do to me. Like I'm gonna take my life into my own hands and get out of my own way and just make this shake like i'm gonna make this work for me and that's exactly what he did which is just like so commendable to like kind of get outside of your own head especially in a situation where you feel like you were given like the really shitty hand in life right because he was claiming to be innocent he was standing by his word and he was mad and pissed off at the world because people you know people believed him but not the not the people who needed to believe him it also got worse when his mother was diagnosed with breast cancer while he was in prison and the guards basically gave him two options they said you can see her for 15 minutes or you can go to her funeral which would you rather do would you rather see her one more time before this before she passes or would you rather go to her funeral and of course he said no like i want to see her and so she came to the jail and he said that they brought him out in shackles around his feet and his stomach and his arms and his hands and that is how he saw her for the last time and that moment really stuck with him because she spent her time telling him over and over again like don't worry the truth is on the way like the truth is gonna prevail and everybody's gonna know like you just you have faith you know you keep believing that your innocence will come to be known and your story will be told and you're not gonna be in here forever just know that no matter what the truth will prevail no matter what she said that over and over again the truth will prevail and unfortunately two weeks later after that visit she passed away finally in 2007 alton logan got a break when an affidavit was released after 26 years wow this is a mess this right here is a mess a hot mess so remember he was appointed a new public defender by the name of erica reddick and right away she was just like there's so many glitches in this story how was this man charged in the first place you see because it made no sense for alton to have been involved in a crime with edgar hope especially seeing as the two had never even met each other before they were arrested it made much more sense that edgar hope would commit this crime with andrew wilson who was his best friend his homeboy from around the way like they did everything together they had been friends for years and Edgar told his attorneys this he was like I don't even know buddy as like I don't even know this dude Alton Logan I've never heard of his name before like I don't know him I've never seen him before he was like but if you asked around the neighborhood like everybody's gonna tell you who I wrote with he was like you can go ask these people this is where they stay this is where you can find them like go and ask them who I be with and they're, they're gonna tell you like it's me and Andrew that's my that's my ride or die like I don't know this Alton character I don't know what y'all talking about 
And with that, you know, Alton's defense team had lost, launched a new investigation. They were reinvestigating the crimes and they were going back through the witnesses, all of the employees from McDonald's, everybody. They were questioning everybody who could have possibly seen anything all over again because they needed to find some new evidence that would clear Alton Logan from the case. Now, the week after Alton Logan and Edgar Hope were charged with the murder, the next, the very following week was the same week that Andrew Wilson and Jackie Wilson were arrested for their crimes. Well, that they were charged for, for their crimes in relation to the murders of the two officers that we talked about last week. In that time, Edgar Hope had already told his lawyer that he committed the crime with Andrew Wilson. And it was said to that around the same time that the trial was happening, Andrew was kind of having this like revelation, this like come to moment where he was trying to make right, I guess, having a change of heart where he was like, all right, I've done some fucked up shit and I need, I better, you know, get shit right before I meet my maker. So Andrew Wilson confessed to his attorneys that he is the one who was involved in the McDonald's shooting, not Elton Logan. This was in 1983. And upon confessing, his lawyers were like, um, we have to tell somebody. Like, hello, you can't just tell us this. And then like, you just basically told us that there's an innocent man in prison paying for your crime. You have to come clean and you have to tell the judge and like let this man out of jail. And, and I can only assume that he did this because he didn't want to get the death penalty. Edgar Hope, in this case was sentenced with the death penalty and and so i can only imagine that this was the the main thing that held him back but andrew wilson said okay you guys can tell you guys can tell the story and let everybody know that this man is innocent but you have to wait until the day that i die you have to sit on this information because i don't want any more consequences from me I don't want to get the death penalty i you know already have life in prison when i die you can release this information and he didn't just say it he wrote it out in an affidavit a, affidavit, a written and signed confession and because of the lawyer client confidentiality clause his lawyers were never able to release that information and so for 26 years his lawyers were sitting on this confession that had Alton Logan in prison it was said that at one time the one of his lawyers literally had the confession written in a shoebox that he just hid under his bed like he was living with a secret literally I couldn't imagine how like difficult that must have been just having a constant like I'm somebody who is like spiritual in a sense and even just having that in my house like having that energy in my house and just literally living with that secret would eat me the fuck up like I would not I wouldn't want that here <laughs> I wouldn't want that in here living with me you know just I feel like that would just be bringing me so much bad vibes every single day. On November 19th, 2007, when Andrew finally passed away from natural causes, the lawyers came forward and broke their silence. They shared the affidavit with Alton's attorneys and you would think that would be it. Like, Andrew confessed, let him out right now. On March 9th of 2008, the tv show if you guys remember there was a tv show called 60 minutes i i don't know if they still have a if they still have a show or if they still do it but they it would be like an hour of just like them covering some story and having like you know the people speak it was just like a really intense like show and they actually did an interview with alton logan and let him tell his story this was after andrew's confession came out and there was finally enough evidence to free him but he had to go through like the trial and all the all the legalities of it and so he was still in jail along with that the chicago sun, sun times released an article telling all about the situation that happened at the same time edgar hope's attorney came forward and said okay yeah you know what actually edgar did tell me a long time ago that it wasn't alton logan that he did this with his homeboy who he's always with no i remember he did say that so there's a bunch of attorneys coming forward like, oh, my client did tell me that, you know, this whole thing is fucked up and yeah, y'all got the wrong man. We knew. Huh? Make it make sense. Now, Alton's defense team was like a little concerned because he was getting all this media attention and his story was getting media attention. And a lot of times that can probe 
other inmates to kind of like make stories and and come forward with like confessions to get time off of their sentence but nobody did that this is one of those times where somebody could have really sabotaged alton logan's opportunity to get out or his just his case in general and nobody came forward or sabotaged anything which is just like not expected it wasn't expected and this is one of those things where i'm just like everything starts to shift and move around when things are supposed to happen for you in your life like if you have a blessing with your name on it and things are supposed to get in the way and they just don't they won't like everything will move to make that that blessing fit your life and this was starting to happen for Alton Logan finally after all this time it was all starting to come to fruition actually the media ended up helping because upon reading this article there was a man who lived all the way on the East Coast now at this point but he came across this article and he saw these words Andrew Wilson McDonald's shotgun in this article and he was like oh my god I know what happened. So this man's name was Joe Prendergra Pendergrass and he, no, it was Pend Prendergrass. Oh my God. <laughs> Joe Prendergrass. Now Joe was an English teacher and he used to, you know, volunteer his time to go to the prison and teach the inmates how to read, how to write, just work with them on whatever they needed help with. And he used to work with Andrew Wilson and upon reading this article he was like oh, his memory just came back at him so fast because he was doing regular visits with Andrew Wilson teaching him how to read and write now mind you that's that's a little fucked up because Andrew had written and signed a confession and he couldn't even read or write so how, make it make sense anyways he had been going to the prison helping Andrew learn to read and write and on one particular day he came to the prison and Andrew was in a rye like he was pissed off he was very emotional he was all upset and Joe asked like what's what's the matter and Andrew informed him that he was getting ready to testify against John Burge if you remember the officer who had administered all of the torture on Andrew's body Andrew was getting ready to testify against him for all the torture and all of the memories were just coming back up and he was he was really worked up and upset about it and you know Joe the teacher kind of started in a in an effort to empathize with him and just calm him down and like refocus him onto the present moment he was like listen man like I know you're innocent I know that they're painting this ugly picture of you but just like stay strong you know saying all the things but this wasn't working and Andrew said Andrew looked at him and was like I'm not a good person like I am NOT a good person I've done some really horrible things he told him I walked into Mc and I'm into a McDonald's with a shotgun and shot bullets where there were kids around like I could have easily hit a kid and this is like one of this is during that time that Andrew was starting to feel really remorseful and just kind of wanting to seek forgiveness have a revelation had a change of heart i don't know he confessed this to the teacher joe pendergrass but he was just the teacher like he wasn't a detective and he wasn't up to date with like all of the things that were happening in the neighborhood so he didn't put two and two together that andrew was talking about this crime that edgar hope and alton logan were involved in like he was just coming to do his job and leave but in 2008 upon reading this article it sparked that memory in great detail and he called up Alton's lawyers and was like I have something to tell you and on April 18th of 2008 26 years later Alton was 28 years 28 years old when he was arrested this court date took place 26 years later when Alton was 55 years old judge Schreier who was a judge who was known for his honesty his compassion he was pretty much known for not being like a crooked judge you know not being biased or racist or any of the things like he was just used to he was known for his honesty and good faith on April 18 2008 in judge Schreier's courtroom Alton Logan's case was called at 11 a.m. and it said that the courtroom was packed 
with people from the public and Alton, Alton Logan had 50 family members that were sitting in the front rows of the courtroom. The judge reviewed all the evidence. There were, you know, the witnesses that he had. Andrew Wilson attorneys, you know, testifying. He had Joe Pendergrass, the English teacher testifying. He had Edgar Hope's attorneys testifying. Even the McDonald's employees, the original witness that was kept out of the first trial and the second trial who said that, you know, Alton Logan and Andrew Wilson's appearance were so similar that it would be easy to get them confused on a lineup. That person testified after reviewing all the evidence, Judge Schreier granted Alton a new trial and set bail at $10,000, which you only have to pay 10%. So all Alton needed was $1,000 to be released for the first time in 26 years. And it said that in that moment, the courtroom went into a ride. It said that Alton began shrieking, crying, just full of emotion as well as his family like it was there were people yelling there were people crying just screaming in excitement they were rejoicing they were happy they couldn't believe that finally the truth had come out after all of these years you know there was never a time where Alton wasn't fighting for his freedom and finally after all this time it was starting to happen it took no time for Alton's family to raise the $1,000 and at 6 p.m. that evening Alton Logan was released from prison for the first time since February of 1982. Now upon being released, his fight wasn't over. They were threatening to retry him. They were trying to build a case against him. And so he was still working with his defense team to try to, you know, keep contain the evidence that would prove his innocence and just work on a defense against whatever they were going to throw at him in his, in his third trial. At the court dates, the prosecuting team kept asking for an extension while they continued to try to gather, gather their evidence against him. But with each month, each extension, each new court date, the judge was growing more and more impatient with the prosecution team. And after months of the case being continued in August, the judge said, all right, y'all are playing with my time and y'all are playing with this man's time, who, which if we can all agree that we've taken up enough of, I'd like to get this show on the road. The judge told them, this is your last extension. Get y'all shit together. Come up with a case or don't, I don't care. But this next month is gonna be the last court date. So either y'all gonna have something or y'all are gonna have nothing, but I ain't, I'm not gonna keep showing up for you guys to keep asking me for an extension. The judge was not here to play, baby. He was like, mm, y'all can waste y'all times, but you're not about to waste my time. That's how I am. Waste your own time. Don't bring that over here. I like to be real intentional with my time. So if you ain't gonna take it seriously, don't come around me. Me and Judge Schreider, we on the same page. I go, we got a lot of similar characteristics. I feel like if I was a judge, that's how I would be. Y'all are not about to sweet talk me into believing that somebody did something that they didn't do. It's clear this man didn't do the crime. Why are y'all trying to build a case? And if you're going to, just do it already. And if you're not, just say that so we can all just move on. Prosecutors eventually concluded that they didn't have a case. Alton Logan had too many witnesses. He had too many te people who were willing to testify on his behalf. I mean, he was innocent and they couldn't come up with enough evidence to prove otherwise. And so on, on September 4th of 2008, they dropped the charges. As a result of that, he was awarded, he was awarded a certificate of innocence as well as $199,000 for in-state compensation for the time he spent in jail. However, whenever somebody is awarded a certificate of innocence, that allows them to then sue. That's exactly what he did. In January of 2013, the city of Chicago agreed to pay Logan $10.25 million in a, re in a federal wrongful conviction lawsuit, baby. He said, give me my motherfucking coin. This is like, y'all owe me that. It's not even like this is the least y'all can do. Like that's, that's my money. That's all my time that y'all took from me. Logan said in a statement after he was exonerated, they're always so quick to convict, but they're slow to fix their mistakes. Talking about the system. If you want to hear the story told from Alton Logan's own words, he did write a book. It is called Justice Failed. 
how legal ethics kept me in prison for 26 years. I'll link the book below so that if you're interested, you can kind of read about his experience and hear the story told from his own words. But what do y'all think? Isn't this crazy? Like Alton already had a really hard time. Like he lost his father at a young age. He was moving around just trying to make the best out of his situation and got caught up in this mess. Now, Edgar Hope and Andrew Wilson, like this wasn't their first go around. I think this was just the first time they got caught. But it's just ironic that Andrew had gotten his little brother in this situation with these two cops and just the week before he had killed another police officer you know granted the officer was undercover at the mcdonald's but him and edgar hope did this and from the beginning from just one week after andrew was charged and edgar was charged they both started confessing that alton had nothing to do with this you know like i said edgar hope and Alton Logan had never even met each other before they were sitting next to each other in the trial. They didn't even know each other. They were being tried together for this murder. And from the beginning, you know, Edgar Hope, in the beginning, he told his lawyers, but he also told them like, you guys can go tell, you guys can go share this information. Like, this isn't some big secret. If you go ask anybody on the block, they'll tell you. And you can also go tell Alton Logan's lawyer if you want, like, but they kind of stuck to that. A lawyer patient privilege even though it he did not ask them to do that <laughs> and I mean while we're on the topic how shitty of Andrew Wilson to know to admit and confess to Alton Logan's innocence but then put this clause on it that you guys can't tell anybody until the day that I die what i mean what i don't know what kind of human you have to be to do something like that and especially like this is a black man to another black man like letting him pay the price you are aware like you're also in jail forever you're never getting out so like why not just admit to it and allow that evidence to be shared in he could have saved alton logan 26 years of his life i mean this this admission came one week after he was put in jail like it wasn't like you know andrew wilson waited 15 years before he shared the information like it happened pretty much right away and everybody knew and had all of this knowledge about it and nobody came forward to help and it's unfortunate because the teacher whose recollection came so many years later or the attorneys who had been sleeping right on top of the information and never were able to share it. It's just difficult on all levels. Now, in Massachusetts, you know, they have the same terms and conditions under the bar and just the expectations for which, um, or the conduct, right, for which lawyers are supposed to perform. However, they have a clause that says that attorney client privilege can be broken if somebody's life depends on it basically if if somebody is wrongfully serving a conviction or if somebody's freedom is contingent upon that information they can break client attorney privilege and do what's necessary to be done to make sure that the right people are being charged for the right crimes and i f just feel like everywhere <laughs> should adopt this method of practicing law in illinois specifically after this incident this should have been like grounds enough for them to adopt that clause and make that a thing in illinois so that this never ever happens again anyways what do you guys think how do you guys feel about everything i feel like this story is just so sad and andrew wilson is really an awful pathetic piece of shit for all the fuck shit that he had caused on this earth i mean why like you caused your kid brother to spend 36 years incarcerated for the wrong reason you caused this innocent man to spend 26 years incarcerated for the wrong reason and you had to spend life in prison all the while like why not just you be the one to suffer from your ignorance and your recklessness and let everybody else live their fucking life i don't know though it sounds like Andrew, like, it sounds like Alton, like, this, in a sense, was kind of like the, you know, when you're moving too fast in life, sometimes life will cause you to slow down, whether you want to or not. 
and it sounds like this is one of those times that started off as something really bad but then something really good came out of it i mean even if alton wouldn't have gotten the settlement he left prison with a whole bunch more knowledge and skills than what he went in with and he went in at 28 years old so there wasn't a lot of opportunity for him and eventually i think he would have found his way but this allowed him you know to gain his own sense of self worth self worth through you know just investing in himself and his own education and his own skill set and he came out better for it granted now he don't need it because he's rich but anyways what do you guys think about the look i'm gonna put on my halloween costume so that you can see exactly why i did this like green look Give me one second Me and a group of my friends are all kind of dressing up. My best friend, she has like my two godchildren. And so we have all been assigned a color and mine is green, which is perfect because green is my favorite anyway. Um, well, my favorite color, not my favorite Power Ranger. And so, yeah, I'm the Green Ranger. And other than that, that is all I have for you guys. I hope you guys enjoyed this story. Um, rest in peace to the officer, Whitcliffe and um, Godspeed to Alton Logan. I hope freedom is treating you lovely. Thank you so much for watching. Don't forget to like, share, subscribe, tell your friends, to tell a friend, to tell a friend, to check out this makeup and true crime stories about exonerations. Be safe, have fun, and I will see you next time. Peace.